So, um, so I'm going to talk about AP Lit today. So hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, if you're not an AP Lit, then welcome to AP Lit. But I assume that you are here for that. Oops. Um, my name is Lara Walton. Um, just a little bit about myself. I taught English for nine years. And for the last two years, I've taught AP Lit. And here I am telling you about AP Lit. Um, and yeah, that's me. I'm in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. Anyone from anyone nearby? Yeah, you don't have to tell me. Um, so a couple of technical things here. So if you haven't done this before, welcome to Fiveable. Um, if you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is so throughout the presentation, throughout me talking, I'm going to people go. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of dots, Diego. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a lovely button. If you look at the bottom kind of middle is ask a question. So if you've got a question while you can type it into the chat too, and I will read it um, at some point, but it's also easier for me to go into and ask, get you to ask a question. I click on it and I can do that. But either way, it doesn't matter if you put it in the chat, I'll put it in the ask a question. So that just means if you ask something and I don't immediately get to it, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just eventually going to get to it. And you will have questions, and I love questions. They are my favorite. That means that you're listening, and it makes me happy. OK. Doo -doo -doo -doo. OK. If you are, so I know y'all are on social media everywhere. Y'all got Twitter. Y'all got Instagram. You go on YouTube. If you're not already following Think Fiveable, do it. It is wonderful. We, you will never miss a uh, pot or a live stream. You will, you'll basically keep up to date, and you'll get all the fun materials that we um, we provide for you as well. So follow us if you're not already doing so. Follow me. I'll give you my actual information as well at the end because there's some things that I can say. Hey, you can message me about this if you're, let's say, your AP Lit teacher is very, very busy. I am probably less busy than they are. So you can always message me with something as well. So you can get me on Twitter or email me on my email, but I'll get that at the end. But Fiveable is the more important one to follow here. So welcome. All right. So I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to go over, today's a lot of technical stuff. This is what I do with my kids on the maybe the first week or so is talk about exam what the AP exam looks like so your AP lit teacher if you are in an AP lit class not online necessarily has maybe talked to you about this a little bit I'm going to go through in probably more detail than they have maybe less maybe your AP lit teacher is as crazy as I am who knows um, I'll talk about very briefly multiple choice I won't talk about that too much today but like what question types you might look for and how it's different from there is a little bit of a difference of the AP lit exam this year than in past years to your advantage which is nice um, there's free response question I'll go through that more in detail also I have a fidget so you might see me playing with the ball I'm a handsy person I like to talk with my hands I will talk about Understanding literature AP Lit style, so how it's different from a regular English class necessarily, and how it's similar and different from AP Lang if you took that before, and then just general skills for AP Lit, which help you out. So I'll ask questions throughout. Um, I'll have you do, we'll do a thing together at the end, looking at some art and whatnot, and hopefully it'll be a good time. So I'll talk about exam parts and the overview. So there's two parts to the exam. I'll talk about both of those parts I'm going to talk more about free response than anything because that's that's what most people get kind of scared of you know that's the part also people tend to do better on too so I'll talk a little about multiple choice so again this is stuff that you may have heard in some of your classes so you got 45 percent of your exam score is the multiple choice part um, so these are going to be questions and I'll give you the formula for actually how many things to expect for it so um, they're going to be multiple choice questions based on they're going to give you little pieces of prose or drama and poetry. If you took AP Lang before, it may it's going to look super familiar to you because it's almost exactly the same format, except it's fiction and poetry instead of um, rhetoric and speeches and things of that sort. Um, so you're going to get I'm going to just flip through all these because I don't know why I did that. So you're going to get one hour to do that multiple choice part. So just like the AP Lang exam, same amount of time. 
There are 55 questions, fun times. You have five things that you are reading. And that depends on what it is. So sometimes it's eight questions, sometimes it's 13, sometimes it's somewhere in the middle. And then there's always at least two pro sets. So here's the formula for you. So you know that you have, you know what to expect on the multiple choice part. So you've always got at least two pro sets and it could be a piece of drama that counts as prose. And I'll also say that prose means not poetry. A lot of, I get that question. I get that question in AP Lit too. So um, don't be afraid to ask that. So prose is anything that's not poetry. And then you're going to get at least two poetry sets as well. So that means that one of the other ones has to be either poetry or prose. So assume half and half. So study both. I personally like the poetry more, but that's just me. I am not going to go through this in much detail. Um, and then the question types that you get are, this is all listed on, if you're looking at the specific exam things, all of these things, what you want to notice here is not necessarily like, oh, laundry list of the types of questions. These are all parts of the story or parts of the poem. What you should notice is the same word being repeated about the multiple choice questions. And that word is function. So instead of asking you questions about who's this character in the story or who, what, what does this word mean in context or who is the narrator? What are they doing? It's why is this narrator doing this? Or why does this character do this? It's really asking questions of why and how and what, what the author's choices are. That's a mind shift for a lot of people in an English class. Um, something else is also different is that there are five, not from the AP Lit exam or AP Lang, but there's five answer choices per question that's different from like the SAT or different tests that you've taken. So you have a little bit less of a chance of getting it right, but you should always guess because there's no penalty for guessing. So, all right. And so I got one question, very good question. And the question is, which is the most common question type? That is a really good question that I don't, I don't think that there, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you um, because I've, done lots of practice tests and I've and people have taken the test and I would say that maybe less I would say some of the least common question types is perhaps of word choice like taking they actually took out the type of question that says what does this word mean in context um, so I would say that's probably less things about specific words themselves as for what is the most common one out of all of these question types they're pretty evenly spaced out now, I would probably say that since this um, function of word choice, imagery, and symbols has more than one thing in it, you're probably going to see more of that. It's talking about the different pieces. And also, that could be both poetry and prose. I would bank on that being probably the most common question type. Um, that's a really good question. I'll also say that something different on the AP exam, too, is that they will ask you a question about an interpretation of the text and ask you which piece of evidence is the best. That's this last one, develop text supported arguments about textual interpretations. So it'll give you answer choices like different quotations. It'll say which one best supports this, um, this view of the text or something of that sort. It's better worded than that. So that's something that's very different. So hopefully that answered your question. Oh, I got another question. Excellent question. Uh, and this question is, which one do you think is the hardest? Which type of question do you think is hardest? I think, honestly, that last one is going to be maybe the most difficult. And I don't like to say which one's hardest and which one's not, because it depends on who you are. Um, but for me, when I'm reading things and I, you may be like me, where you're like, you come up with your own interpretation or your own argument and someone else's argument, you're like, well, how do I know that's the evidence for that? So if you're like me and you overthink things, then that last one, develop tech supported arguments is going to be the most difficult, but I think it just depends on you. So this is, that's, yeah, that just depends on what your skills are at the beginning and what you, what you feel like you need to work on. So taking diagnostic stuff helps a lot. Cool. Um, and I'll, and I got one more question. Cool. So this question is, which one do you think will appear most on the exam? That is a good question because they have just changed um, their wording of these questions. So I am not sure about that either. This is a, it's not a brand new test, but it's a different way that they're scoring it this year. 
not too much different. Multiple choice will be scored the same, but like I said, they took out that diction question, not the diction question, the definition question. So there may be more of one than the other. So I'm not sure. I don't know. That's not the greatest answer to the question, but yeah, it could be anything. Keep them coming. Hopefully those are answering your questions. And uh, if you got questions about multiple choice, even if I'm talking about another part of, the part of the test, keep on asking it. I'm happy to go back and talk about anything. That's my job today. Oops, that is not the right button. All right, let's talk free response. Any other questions about uh, multiple choice? Before I move on to re free response again, if they come up, just ask them. All right. So free response. So this is this is my favorite part to teach because it's I think it's easier to teach too, and people tend to like it better because you can give you have more of a a personality in this versus answering A B C D E, for sure. There's still a particular interpretation they want, but you can you can stretch it sometimes versus in multiple choice. So I'm gonna go ahead and put all these up here. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so um, AP Lib Free Response is 55% of your exam score, so it's worth more. So if you're going to f if you're going to focus on one part and you really really want to do fairly well, you want to focus more on the free response and multiple choice. You can practice with that um, with practice exams. You want to work on your writing and your reading as well. Of course, it's AP Lit, um, so it's worth more. You get, and so the last one, so again, this is the same ish as AP Lang. So you get two hours for reading, planning, and responding to three prompts. The difference is there is no 15 minute break between um, two types of questions. I think the AP Lang exam has you like different things between the synthesis question and others. So you have time to plan it. Um, do, 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 do. Yes. So you get to, you have to read in two hours, you read three different pieces, three different prompts, and write three different essays. And for this, you are assessed on the, or lots of different things. Um, the quality of your reasoning, so your thesis and actually writing a thesis that makes sense. Using appropriate evidence, you're developing your essay, so writing something that is that reads well, and then using appropriate grammar and punctuation. That last one is not as important as the other things. You can get a high score on an essay without, you can misspell some words. If you misspell all your words, then you have bigger problems. But um, that's something that can be fixed. Ooh, I got a question. Okay, so the question here is, how much time should we take on each essay? So that's a really good question. And the cool thing about the AP exam is it gives you an estimated amount of time to do it. So their estimated time is about 40 minutes per um, question. And when you actually take the exam, the proctor will say you have, they'll tell you like, it is advised that you move on to the next essay. So you get kind of clues. You can choose to take as much time or as little time as you want. But 40 minutes is the suggested time because that's evened out. So that means, again, you get 40 minutes to read the prompt, read the piece, and plan out and write an essay. So that's something that if you can't do that now, that's understandable. You'll get better at it as you keep going. Cool. Other questions about that free, I'm going to talk about the different types, but other questions generally about free response. It's cool if you don't. Um, oh, there's also something else I didn't put here is the, so in the past too, so if you've taken AP Lang, then there was another, the rubric was done from one to nine. They've actually changed that this year. So instead of like a, between an eight and a nine, they give you a paragraph that tells you how well or what you, what the what an eight or nine essay looks like there's actually a numerical rubric that they are using so it's more of a checklist this time so it's that is an interesting it's still the same kinds of prompts it's still they're still looking for the same things but this time it's not so what they call holistic grading which is a little more nebulous than number grading so that might make some of you feel better that might make some of you feel worse who knows i'm a mathy kind of person a math english kind of in the middle so i kind of like it Oops, 
So yeah. Okay. So you got three types. So in AP Lang, it was a little different. Um, so you get so just like the multiple choice, there are three types, but the one that's different is the last one. So you got poetry analysis is Q1. So you're gonna get. A, I'll go through each of these in detail. You get prose analysis, which is Q2. So whenever you see me on a live stream, those are the th those are the terms I'll use. But I'll always say like if it's a poem or if it's a prose piece. And then finally is a theme or independent analysis, which well, we'll talk about that in a second. You may have already done some of these. Oops. A uh, question for you. Has anyone had to, in their first week in, or first two weeks in AP Lit, have they had to do any sort of um, practice multiple choice or practice essay? Or has anyone already written an essay for AP Lit? Aha, I knew it. Oh, yeah. Yes. At this point, yeah. So in a couple weeks in, generally your teacher gives you something. Nope, lucky you, Nia. I would usually give some sort of diagnostic to my kids um, first two weeks or so. And that wasn't to like trick anybody. It was to see, hey, where are you? And hopefully that's what your teacher is doing too, is just to see where are you and where can you go and to really set goals for yourself. So if you haven't taken one and you don't think your teacher is going to give you practice one, I would suggest going and looking for, um, when was I going to say, um, there are practice prompts all over online and your teacher has some too. So ask them, they will be happy to give you them, I'm sure. I know I was happy when someone asked me for extra stuff. That's also a little crazy and I know it. Okay. SpongeBob, back to him, imagination time. So poetry analysis is a key one. So the first question is, as far as I know, always about poetry. Another thing, sorry, I'm kind of pulling back a little bit. You don't have to do these in order, Q1, Q2, Q3. You can start with prose, you can go to poetry, you can do theme, or you can do whatever you want. They're not gonna make you not flip back and forth. You can go back and edit an essay that you were working on. So that's the good thing. So I'll actually, I have a question, but I'll answer that in just a moment because that's a really good question that I got there. Oops. Because I'll go through these and I'll talk about that. Awesome. Um, so they're going to give you at least one poem, sometimes two. They haven't done that in a while. Um, I think the last one was maybe in 2007, 8, 9. I don't remember exactly. So about 10 years ago. Good Lord, that was 10 years ago. Um, they gave two poems and they would have you compare and contrast them. Um, I told my kids that to think of it in two ways, either that they don't want to or they, they realize that two poems is a lot to read and they won't do whatever again, or it's about time there's two more poems. So I told them to err on the side of the second one. And actually, my kids ended up doing better with those anyway. But um, so expect at least one poem. It can be long. It can be short. There's no telling what they'll do. It could be old as crap. It could be something that was just written a, a year ago. I've seen them all. Um, so those prompts, the different prompts that you're going to look at, and I'm not going to talk too much about that because actually one of my live streams later on is about looking at a prompt and being able to break it down. Um, but the different prompts will ask you lots of different things. So they might, but they will only ask you to look at one particular thing. So like characterization, how is this person characterized in here? Or they'll ask you like, what is, how is this theme exemplified in the poem? Um, they love the phrase, the complex portrayal of blank. So how does the poet um, make the complex portrayal of fatherhood in this poem? Everything's complex. So if you see complex on there, don't freak out. Everything you read in AP literature is going to be complex. Or they might ask you about irony, but usually they won't straight up ask you about irony. You'll just have to find it yourself. Okay. So that's poetry. That's the poetry analysis. Remember, ask questions when you got them. <clears throat> Prose is almost exactly the same, except it's prose. So it can be a piece of a novel, a short story, or a play. Um, usually it's, no, it's not usually anything. I, I would say I haven't seen a play. No, I keep saying that, and that's not true. There's no usual for it. They're all about used evenly in the last several years. So, um, and they're going to ask you about the same things, except it's prose again. 
Um, so they're asking you similar characterization themes, complex portrayal, all that good stuff. So it's going to be about, so it depends. So some, and what's going to happen is you can be good at either one of these. You're probably going to find that you're stronger with one over the other. That's okay. Just try to get strong-ish on both of them. And I am going to some, yeah, we got a question. Okay. Yes, we got two excellent questions. I will go back to that in just a moment. Awesome. Um, and it actually will lead into the questions that I'm getting to. So theme analysis is our last one. And I've always called this independent analysis too, um, because it has to do with independent reading. So the last one is going to ask you to discuss this. So kind of like your synthesis question in an AP Lang, in the way that it is more of an independent analysis, not that you're synthesizing something. Um, so the prompts are going to ask you to discuss a specific theme, concept, or issue present in a work chosen by you. So you get freedom to actually choose what piece you're, you're going to talk about. There are a couple caveats in there. I'll tell you about them in a second. So this, some of these, these are ones from the past. I have a huge list of ones from the past. If you want that, I will, again, I'll give you my contact info at the end. I will send you that if you need it. So some examples of cruelty. These are, these are literal ones that were taken from past exams. Um, they'll talk, well, find a symbol and talk about it from this book. They'll ask symbolism of title, how surrounding shape a character. Of course, again, these are all used before, so they probably won't use them again, but they may reuse something similar. Um, I love literature, but there's only so much you can talk about with it. And um, what it'll look like is it'll ask you the question and what it'll have is a bunch of works listed at the bottom of the thing. So you get a piece of list, of, yeah, a list of pieces to choose from, but I tell my kids to cover up that list with a piece of paper or your hand. Do not look at that list and just read the question because what happens is one of two things. One, you read the list and you don't see the work you wanna use and you freak out and you're like, oh my gosh, my work's not going to work. Or number two, Actually, that's pretty much number one. I don't know what number two was going to be. Um, but they freak out that it's not on there. But understand that there's literally millions of books. They can't put millions of books on the exam. So if your book's not on there, but it totally has a symbol in it that would work, and your question's about symbolism, use that book. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to comparable literary merit in a moment. I want to answer these questions because they go very well with this. So I got one question that is, do you think it's better to practice essays or read? Yes, is the answer. Um, no, but I actually think it's better to read as much as you can. So the answer is actually to read and to read deeply. And I'll and later on in the live stream, I'll talk about what reading for AP Lit really looks like. So reading as widely, reading widely, but also reading deeply. So you want to always have some sort of book that you're reading. It can be a class book, but I would say have the book you're reading in class, but also have one on the side too, at least one. As many as you can, not as many as you can handle, as many, like, yeah, have a, have a book, have a book that you're reading. So reading as much as you can. And then the second question here is, what is a way of practicing for the essay without having to write an essay? One, let's see. So I guess it'd be practicing for, hmm. And um, if I don't answer your question, you may need to ask it in another way. I'm, I'm going to try to. So practicing for the essay without actually writing it is to look at as many, okay, you can look at as many prompts as you can find, which there are all of, just about all of them are available. Like you can look online, you don't have to sign in anywhere on 2AP Central and you can get those prompts. Um, and you can practice writing a thesis statement for them. So, and that can go for Q1, Q2, Q3. Um, or you can also practice without, if you don't want to write the entire essay with it, you can look at those prompts, write a thesis, plan out an essay. I do strongly suggest, of course, that you at least practice writing essays because it's about also timing yourself as well. So that's one of the things that you want to do. So you want to time yourself reading those eventually and writing those thesis statements and planning. So that's, that's one way to that's, that's a really good way to practice without writing the whole thing, but definitely write essays. You're going to want to, and and your teacher will look at them too. Oops. So if I did not answer that question the way you wanted it, please ask another one or ask it again. Hopefully I did. Um, okay. And then the, oh yeah. So then they'll have a, a lovely 
line at the end of it. So this is the way that you get to pick any question you want. So this is back to Q3. So they'll give you the list of things like choose a work from a list below or a work of comparable literary merit. That means you're cho that's, that's your go-to to say, oh, I can choose whatever I want, mm, kind of. You can choose, so comparable literary merit means that it has the same, it's like on the same level as the books that are listed. So that can be kind of lexile level. That means the difficulty of the words, um, but it also means that it is able to be analyzed at the same level as those books. It's a really nebulous term. Um, things that would not be of comparable literary merit would be like how the Grinch stole Christmas or, um, <laughs> I don't know, anything Dr. Susie or something that you may have read in, let's say, elementary school, even middle school. But some things you read in middle school work, too. Um, the fun thing that likes to toe the line is things like um, young adult lit, like Harry Potter. Yeah, it can be um, analyzed at, the, at a level that it's like AP lit style. But if you have another book that's a little bit of a... And I hate to say it because I love literature, I love reading all kinds, but a little bit of a higher level one you read in class, I would use that instead because you're risking maybe not getting the question like they want you to. Let's see. Okay, so I have a question here. Um, what gives you the most points? The I think that says free. It says R F R Q, but it may be free response or the multiple choice. And if I'm not reading correctly, please ask it again. Um, the one that's going to give you more, the free response is worth more. So the free response is 55% versus 45% of the multiple choice. So if you're really going to focus on working on something and you want to get, I mean, if you're really, if you're going to focus your studying on one part of it, you don't want to focus on only one part, but you, if you're going to focus, focus on getting those essays good, well. Done well. There we go. My goodness, my grammar's not working. So again, if I didn't answer that, ask that again. Okay. Um, any anything else with? I think that's it for my talking about that. Yeah. Okay. So, hmm. I guess my question is too. What I want to ask is, what are you reading right now? on your own. And it doesn't have to be something of comparable literary merit. I always like to know what people are reading. And I can tell you too, what is comparable literary merit as well. For something on the AP exam, and when it's comparing, it's comparing stuff on those lists that they give you. So what are you reading? Type it in the chat. It could be a magazine for all I care, but ideally a book that you are reading. And it could be something you're reading in class or something on your own. I'm reading two books right now because I'm a masochist. Oh, I'm about to read The Winter's Tale, so I have an Exit Pursued by Bear. Is that like actually a different book? Aha. That, Olivia, I won't say the, the title of that here, but that is a book that, uh, that will help you get through the year, for sure. It'll help all anxiety. It'll make you feel good. We're rising visible man. It's a good ooh, the invisible. Okay, there's okay. In Game of Thrones. I read Game of Thrones. Very good. I am currently reading a book called 1Q84, and it is a dystopian novel by Haruki Murakami, and it is really good. It is really, really weird, and it is also really, really long. I don't know why I started this. It's like a thousand thirteen hundred pages. I've lost my mind, but it's really good. And I will finish it maybe in like December. But um, so some of these, so yeah, so so for Game of Thrones is a great example of towing that line between comparable literary merit and literary merit, I guess, is it can possibly be analyzed at the level that they're looking for, but it just depends on your question and you have to do it really, really well. I will say another one that kind of toes the line is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is, can be analyzed because it's got so much irony in it, if you've read that before, that it, it will work for a lot of different themes. Um, yeah, basically anything that you read in high school can be can work as comparable literary merit. You can also check Lexile levels on, um, there's, there's a website you can check, but you can also just type in Lexile level of Game of Thrones on Google and it'll tell you. 
lots of different stuff, lots of different resources to see like where the level is of the book, seeing if it's like comparable, seeing all that good stuff. Um, if at any point too, again, I'll give you my contact information. If you've got a book, you're like, is this of comparable literary merit? I'll give you my opinion on it and say yes or no. Oh, the other book I'm reading is Crazy Rich Asians. That's a fun book. So I'm doing like a hard book and an easy book at the same time. That's what I tend to do. Okay, theme analysis. Oh, I wanna see the movie. I gotta finish the book though. I'm one of those people like, I can't go see the movie until I finish the book. And my mom just finished it too. So I told her not to spoil it for me. <gasps> I love crying at the end of movies. Am I gonna cry at the end of the movie? I'm a big cry baby. I will totally watch it. Maybe I'll just, I mean, I'm sure that I can watch it and still enjoy the book. Cause it, it definitely reads like a movie for sure. Okay, yep, you've you've convinced me. I'm gonna do it. I gotta finish another movie first, but I'm gonna watch the movie. I'm excited. All right. Romantic. Okay, this is not romantic, but okay, but Lara, you ask. So I've gone over the test and you may be thinking, well, okay, and you may have an idea of now AP Lit's different. Some of you had some kind of like Ugh, faces at the beginning or sleepy face. How is AP Lit different from my other English classes and from AP Lang? And I've talked about this for a little bit. This is my favorite SpongeBob face ever because it exactly is the sentiment that I want to have when someone asks me a question like that. Give me a moment, water. Oh, do I have an answer for you? Okay, <clears throat> actually, I have several answers for you. So the so I'll talk first about the difference. Okay, I'll ask you another question that I don't think I asked you this. How many of you took AP Lang? AP Language and Composition. Let me say that whole name. I loved AP Lang. Yep. I wish. Cricket noises. <laughs> Thanks, Santiago. Cool. I got one. Because I don't want to talk too much in a vacuum like, oh, an AP Lang was this and I have nobody who took AP Lang. So good. There's at least one of you that has taken it. You don't have to have taken AP Lang to do well in AP literature. It just gives you a little bit of an advantage knowing the test and the structure and about reading really into text, but you totally don't have to have taken. I had a lot of people last year take AP literature and that was the first AP class that they took. So even taking an AP class gives you a leg up, but you can still be successful in AP Lit without taking AP Lang. Um, okay, so I'll talk first about difference between AP Lit and AP Lang. So in AP Lang, you did a lot of you did more analysis, synthesis of text and cr I guess criticism of, of nonfiction text. Nonfiction and fiction are the two big differences between the two classes. So you were commenting on a, um, a writer's argument or on their rhetoric or something of that sort. So you had, I think you had more of a chance to insert your opinion about things, but also you're doing it with showing evidence. So that's something that you still do. Literary analysis, so my kids who did take AP Lang and they went to AP Lit had to kind of break the habit of giving their opinion about stories. Um, the readers on the AP Lit exam don't care about what you think about the story. It may be the worst thing you've ever read. And there are some things I've read on there that were not very fun to read. They don't care if you don't like them. Um, maybe in a level of like, oh, I wish I'd put something more interesting on here. I don't know. But they're, they don't want that in your essay. And there's no multiple choice question that says, what did you think of this thing? So you're analyzing the literature as is. You're not looking at how, like, do I think the author did this well? It's what, how did the author do this and why? And that makes sense. Hopefully it does. Um, yeah. So that's the difference between AP Lit, AP Lang, but it can also be the difference between uh, another English class as well like not looking for an opinion necessarily. We're really looking more, and I just, I mentioned this a moment ago, is how and why versus what. So instead of, and this had to do with the multiple choice, I mentioned this before, they're asking for the function of things. They're asking for how the author does this and why the author does this and is it effective. Um, so instead of saying, 
like this is a metaphor in the text and we'll we'll do a couple of examples in just a second you see the examples down there um you wouldn't just point out it's a metaphor you would say how this metaphor gives the makes the story move forward or how this metaphor shows the theme that the author is trying to go for so you're looking you're answering the question how and why versus what so you have to dig into that text more and more I found that when I took AP Lit, that it was very, like, I felt, like, very proud of myself for being able to recognize that they were um, literary devices, and that was great, and thumbs up for that, but it was, I did not do well be, in, in the beginning because it was, I wasn't just looking for those literary devices, I had to use those literary devices to make an argument. So that's something to get used to. If you're not doing that already, that's okay, that's the point of the class, is to get better. So remember that too. The point of the class is not to be good at it immediately. It's to get better at it and to be prepared for college reading and writing. By the end of it, that's what you want to be able to do. I am so sorry. My voice is running out. Let's get some water. Ugh. I like to tell my kids this third bullet, all roads lead to tone and irony. If you can find the tone of a piece, you can find the author's purpose because the tone tells you why the author, what the author believes about a particular subject or character or something. So you want to look for that. And you always want to, I shouldn't say assume it, but you should always look for irony. So if the author actually means what they are talking about. So you always, and when um, the later ones, we'll look at that too. But that's something that I focus on for quite some time and actually in every single thing that we do like the the stories and whatnot we do that so i'm going to give you an example so you get to actually do something and listen not listen to me talk for too much so i have two different things i got a painting for you and i've got a short poem that i enjoy by mr billy collins he's one of my favorite poets and it was one of my kids favorite poets too so i got a couple questions for you so you get to answer things ha ha okay so, yes, awesome, the painting loaded. So this is a painting that I give my kiddos on maybe like week two, week three. And this is to get people used to looking at a piece of literature in the way that AP Lit needs to have you look at it. So not just looking at surface level stuff, but looking into it. So I will ask you to think about the difference between these questions. So. My first question is, so this is the, yeah. So what do you see? Literally, what do you see in the painting? And this can be, you know, I'm not gonna say anything. What do you see? Yep, a mountain. Very, very simple stuff. So you can just say literally what you're seeing, very simple stuff, yep. Men walking towards a building, people, yep. Landscape, an old building. Mountain and a woman and a man, men, yep. Cloudy sky, very good. Trees, lots of trees, trees everywhere. Ah, there's some water. Yes, a woman with the red dress. We're getting a little bit deeper into that. Cool. People climbing. Bridges, yes. Quite. Keep going, keep looking. This is still the what. Because you use the what to help you answer the why and the how. So it's okay, you want to look at the what. What else do you see? Look far, like get up, get up real close to your screen and see what you can see. Good, it's got more detail, walk and stick. Yes, we got some variable color in the sky. Yeah, the clouds are pretty weird. I would agree with that. Yeah, we've got some, perhaps some wind going on, blowing those clouds around. Animals up ahead, very good. Yeah, we got some sheep in the foreground, in the middle foreground. My terms, you know what I mean. Kind of in the back, but not really. Clouds, yes, we like the clouds. Yes, good. So they're walking towards darkness. Awesome. So where they're walking is dark and suspicious. I like that. Keep them coming. Literal colors that you see, you can list that. 
light is behind the building. Good, yeah, get get into your art. If you're like art, what do you call art analysis buff, then get into that. Start like getting whatever you want to get to. Sizes. So I have a question here. Should the scene be described on a basis of what we see or in a deeper philosophical way? At this point with the what, uh, you can, you're looking at what you're literally seeing, but you can still point out things that are philosophical because that may get into the how and the why. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to get mad if you start to like analyze what you're seeing. So go ahead, answer what you want to, because you sometimes do that automatically. The clouds are only really darker the building. Yeah, you can get deeper philosophical. You want to get deep, deeper, so we can keep pointing out stuff. Every oh yeah, every painting has a meaning. If the artist or the writer bothers to write it or paint it, then it has a deeper meaning, even if the meaning is only to you. But seriously, if you took the time to write it, it's there for a reason. Yeah. So. So you're taking all those different things. So there's lots of things you could point at. You could stare at this painting for hours. You could be one of those people in the museum just looking in, in awe at the painting. Yes, there is light coming through the building windows. Yes, might symbolize an old city gone to ruin. And when I give my kids this, I have the title of the painting. And the painting is the um, ruins of Mount Palatine in Rome. It's not exactly that title, but it has the ruins in there. So yeah, knowing that it is ruins, but you can see that too, um, helps to look at it as well. Yeah, okay. So let's move. So we got lots of what's and you can keep looking at those what's and you'll find all kinds of what's in there. And it can be philosophical what's if you'd like. So then the question is, how does the artist portray particular themes and symbols? So this is the, this is getting a little bit deeper into how, what the artist is doing. So this helps with people. Um, no, I'm not going to say that. It was more, you may have uh, less difficulty if you know art or you're an artist and you're able to say things like brush strokes. But even if you're not an artist, you can talk about colors and what they're doing. Yeah. Use of light. What is that? Yeah. You, so you want to think about what that use of light does. So maybe the use of light, you would go a little bit farther than that. So it depends on what theme you're thinking of here. The light gives it a look of glory. Oh, I like that. What else do you see? How is the artist portraying these things? You can still say, you can branch off other people. You can say like the light is look of hope, but there you go. So you got a theme. So you, the, the artist portrays this look of hope with the lights in the painting. Yeah, so this is where you're getting more philosophical. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, the brighter lights show hope. Yeah, I like that. Walking to hope. Yeah, they're kind of coming from darkness into light. Sure. Or the light means discovery. See, yeah, you can interpret this in different ways. This is the fun part. So it doesn't have to have one interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Could be representing a church, the building. Hmm. I'll say when I'm looking at it, so keep keep putting your interpretations, your hows in there. Um, I'm looking at how small the people are in comparison to the building. So that's my what, and then my how might be that. It's, it could be showing the theme of man versus nature or man versus time or something like that. So showing that difference in size could be that. Or you could use the light and the darkness, like light being enlightenment, ignorance is darkness, um, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, I like that. The journey to discovery. Yes. So you would describe how their journey, like what, what the things in the painting are doing the journey to discovery. So using those what's to describe the how. 
Now I'll move it on one more. You can keep talking about the how. The why tends to be the hardest part. Sorry if my picture is like covering this up, so I'll read it. Why does the author portray this, these this way? So that's the one that people tend to have the hardest part. People are wearing some old style clothing, meaning the ruins are way older. Yeah, definitely. So that's something to point out for that what, and then so you want to look at that to move it into the how, or or this would be a good one for the why. So why would the artist portray the people wearing modern clothing going to see a ruin? And that's what you would think about as you're looking at the painting. Like what, why would the author make these choices? Why is the author using light? Or why is there a difference in darkness? Why is there a difference in size? Why not choose this over this? Why not choose to make the people huge and the building big, small? Frankly, that would be a weird choice. Yeah, to so show the importance of the place. So you want to make the building much bigger. If you wanted to make the people prominent, then you'd make the people bigger. Yeah, stuff like that. But hopefully you're seeing the difference. Shows how nature will always power. Oh, yeah, see, that's that's what I like about that. Yeah, it, and the looking at that building too, like... The building was built by people once. You've got the nature growing over it, so that nature is always going to win. It's a really cool painting. I also like to use, if you're familiar with it, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. That one's insane. But so that's when you can really look at the what, how, and the why. But I did not use that one today because that one's, like I said, it's a little insane. It's a little overwhelming for people. But look it up. It's fun. So anyway, so hopefully you're seeing what I mean by difference between what, how, and why. So the what's are just, I'm pointing out the things that are happening. And the what's can be things like metaphors and similes and, and really actually deeper stuff. You can talk about metathesis and crazy syntactical stuff without even getting into the why or the how. You can also talk about really simple stuff and get into the why. So you can always just talk about imagery and get a really, really deep analysis of something. So your key is not the exactly what you're looking at, but using that what to um, to look at it in a deeper level. Uh, what time have we got? Okay, we have a little bit of time. I will go over. So I got a poem. I'm not going to go over this too much, but I wanted to give you something that was actually a written example. Um. This is a fun poem, fun-ish. It's kind of sad, but it's also fun-ish. I keep saying that. And what I'll ask you is kind of the same thing, but I'll, I'll talk about like what, what a what looks like versus what a how and why looks like when you're writing about it. Um, I will, I can read it out loud since we're kind of running out of time. So it's called The History Teacher by Billy Collins. If you have not read Billy Collins, you should because he's amazing. Um, even if you don't, he tends to make, like when my classes, the people who said that they don't like poetry like Billy Collins. And Billy Collins has appeared several times on the AP exam recently. Like in the last, I would say 15 years or so, he's maybe appeared like two or three times. That's a lot for one poet that is in modern times. So read him. He's fun. So looking at the how, the what, the how, and the why here. Trying to protect his students' innocence, he told them the Ice Age was really just the Chilly Age, a period of a million years where everyone had to wear sweaters. And the Stone Age became the Gravel Age, named after the long driveways of the time. The Spanish Inquisition was nothing more than an outbreak of questions such as, how far is it from here to Madrid? What do you call the matador's hat? The War of the Roses took place in the garden, and the Enola Gay dropped one tiny atom on Japan. The children would leave his classroom for the playground and torment the weak and the smart, mussing up their hair and breaking their glasses, while he gathered his notes and walked home, past flower beds and white picket fences, wondering if they would believe that soldiers in the Boer War took long, rambling stories designed to make the enemy nod off. So, fun, but, like, not good times. So because I'm going to be switching the slide, you probably you won't be able to see the poem really well, but you have a general idea of what's going on in the poem. There's a, so I'll give you the what's. So this is what it would look like if you're writing it about a written piece. So you can still do the same kind of analysis like you would do for art, but you're looking at writing instead, which can be more or less difficult depending on how your brain works. Um, so the what's of the poem, you would say what it is about. So you've got that down. The poem is about a history teacher who sugarcoats historical events. You can point out things like imagery, the children bullying children. You can point out, again, there's no rhyme or rhythm scheme. And the tone is lighthearted. So these are things that you want to look at, imagery, 
rhyme scheme tone, but they're not going to get the deep level that you need to in AP Lit. They will get you towards that level. So even pointing out that there is a metaphor, go beyond pointing out there's a metaphor and actually point out what it does. Oops, I keep doing that. I keep doing the wrong thing. Um, so the whys and hows look more like this. You would talk about that imagery still, but you would say like the shift in imagery uh, shows the shift in blank and blank. So you're moving, you're taking that what and moving it into a how or a why. Or the lack of a rhyme scheme indicates a blank tone by doing blank. Or the tonal shift shows a shift in blank by doing. So you're not just saying there is a shift, you're saying the shift does this and does this, or the author does this in order to portray this. So, uh, so for some of you are like, duh, of course that is. And some of you are like, oh, okay, that's what I do. Um, even those of you that say, duh, it's, it, even for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, cool, I pointed that out. And it's actually, a, it's a little more difficult sometimes than we think it's going to be. And I would also say that it's more difficult for something that you have trouble understanding too. <clears throat> so that's why it's really important to read widely, read different um, time periods of literature and read um, deeply as well. So that's it for that. I went through that really quickly, but that was just, again, to give you an idea of what it looks like to answer a question like that. And again, later, when I'm not going over the tests and things and later live streams, I'll actually go through things with you and we will be able to write it ourselves. Okay, so skills for AP Lit. So things you want to be able to do in AP Lit and by the end of AP Lit, but really starting to build these up now is reading, thinking, and writing under time pressure. So right now, um, you may have had a, an essay that you've already written or already writing for AP Lit. Um, I don't know if it, for mine, I would give my kids as much time as they needed for the first one so they know how it feels to write, even just respond to a prompt. But what you want to build up doing, and this is going back to that question about how can I practice an essay without um, writing an essay, you can practice, but I would say practice writing that essay. Practice timing yourself, giving yourself 40 minutes to write an essay because it is a lot to do in that time. And the more you do it, it's like muscle memory. Um, your teacher should give you timed writings. If they don't, I'll, I'll be happy to give you timed writings. I'll give you some examples if you'd like to, but you're, you should be getting timed writings. You'll probably get more than you'll ever want to do. Um, reading, again, a lot, like a lot, a lot, like always have at least one book, like I said. So most of you are reading a book. That is fantastic. Keep doing that. Keep reading. Um, what I can also provide, there's a giant list of the most commonly used books since 1970 on the AP exam. That is what I give my kids. Um, if you want that, I'm happy to give that and I'll put that, I'll put that in my next stream. So people actually have these links. Um, you want to read more than once. So you want to get used to the idea of, I'm going to read a book. Congratulations, you finished a book, but you need to probably read it again. Um, you want to have at least, I would say at least four or five books that you know really well by the time you are taking the AP exam. And that means that you have read those books more than once, at least twice, maybe three times. You're crazy like an English teacher. Um, that can also be that you read it maybe in ninth grade and then you read it again in 12th grade. Um, but you want to you want to read more than once and you want to be annotating too. So you want to um, later live streams will also help you how to do this, but that's marking your text and making notes as you are reading about what's happening. It really does work and you want to do that on the exam. And then one of the things too you want to move away from is plot summary, which is really common. Um, we really want to, and that's, that is, that's not your fault. That's kind of what we've been used to doing in elementary middle school is saying, cool, I read the book, let me prove I read it. It's no longer proving that you read the book, it's proving that you read it and you understand it at the college level. Or proving that you read it and understand it at a higher level. So by the end of it, you're knowing it at a college level. Right now, you don't know stuff at a college level. Maybe you do, congratulations. But um, you're not expected to. That's why you're taking the class, it's okay. So you wanna move towards literary analysis versus here's my book. I think that. I think I have one. Okay, so that's it for that. I'll talk about next streams and then, but I'll open up to any questions that y'all have for, actually, I'll, I'll give you a chance to ask the questions, but I'll keep talking. And then if I see the questions, I'll answer them. So if you want to follow me, my Twitter is at Miss underscore Walbotch. Walbotch is a combination of my <clears throat> current last name and my uh, previous name. 
no one ever takes wall botch. So that's why that is what it is. So if you want to get some of the information I talked about today, if you just want to have a, if you want to have a quick question, you just want to message me on Twitter, send me something, send me a tweet, send me something funny. You can do that. And also my email, if you want something like a Rexloop file or anything like that, I'm Laura Walton teacher at gmail.com. So feel free to message me with anything that you got. I'll leave that up for just a moment for you. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I didn't didn't fall asleep. Trying to make trying to make things that are kind of straightforward. We'll say that. Straightforward, a little more interesting. Hopefully I'm putting my personality in here. I I actually like kind of talking about the exam, but I don't know. Sometimes people their eyes glaze over talking about it. Oh, that is my ending. Okay, cool. So uh, I don't currently see any questions. If you, again, if you've got burning, burning questions, there's my contact information, but um, that is pretty much it. Um, so let's get one last emoji for how are you feeling about the AP Lit exam now? Yeah, you're welcome. One last emoji. Y'all are so welcome. Thanks for coming. How's that AP Lit exam feeling? Okay, we got okay, we got some better faces. Awesome. We got the kind of sarcastic smile face. That's okay. The greedy face. Oh, we got a thumbs up. Awesome. Yes. Okay, these faces look a little bit better. That's awesome. I didn't get any poop emojis this time. That's surprising. Aha. I like that's my problem. Naya, that's probably my favorite face. And the winky face that's like the tongue sticking out. That's my favorite one. That's how I feel about the AP exam. Like, I got this, but, like, kind of? All right, y'all. Thank you so much for coming out, and hopefully I will see y'all next week, same time. Have a lovely night, and happy Friday, Eve.